the two-wheeler sector has been more affected by the fact that rural demand has been subdued uh, and on top of which a number of uh, regulatory measures have required technologies to be changed or uh, technologies to be enhanced. In the case of two-wheelers, you know, motorcycles beyond 125 cc had to have ABS braking systems, they had to have uh, linked braking systems, they had to have insurance pre-bought for two years. All, these are all small elements and perhaps in the long term desirable elements, but they've had an effect in uh, creating some degree of sticker shock to consumers. If you take cars, there were a different set of factors, some of them again related to the softness of demand uh, and the fact that as the proportion of cars that are replacement cars, basically people upgrading from one model to the other, as that fraction of the sales starts to grow, it becomes a bit of a discretionary expenditure that can be deferred for some period of time. And certainly the trucks have yet another set of dynamics. Uh, we've seen uh, the slump in the overall economy has certainly led to a drop in the freight demand, but that came on top of a uh, larger number of trucks with heavier axle loads, so you had increase in freight logistics fleet capacity, on top of which the government had decided in its own way to allow a certain measure of overloading, uh, and on top of which, you know, the faster turnaround times because of faster uh, travel through the highways and the avoidance of all these off -trois. and So all of this has effectively increased fleet capacity and understandably, uh, you know, people needed to replace their fleets uh, less, less often. Now all of this uh, would have been easy to accept uh, in any other year. But uh, this past year was to be a rather pivotal year because we are on the on, on the threshold of moving to this next degree of the stage of norms with BS6. Uh, wherever you go in the world, whenever there is a change in regulatory norms, the year before the change happens is usually a very good year for the industry because there is a certain amount of pre-buying. Uh, people who are particularly commercial fleet users, for them, uh, they, they don't care whether you have a BS4 truck or a BS6 truck. And if a BS6 truck is going to be anywhere between 5 and 10% or maybe 15% more expensive, you'd rather pre-buy the, the, the model in the previous year. So there was expectation that there would be some pre-buying and that this would buoy the demand ahead of going into a year when we knew demand would be somewhat difficult because of the price increase. So uh, the fact that this year was not a bumper year, but rather a year of uh, demand slump uh, is a bit of a setback for the industry. Um, when, you, when you add up all of the natural causes and factors, one is not surprised, uh, but it is indeed uh, an unfortunate consequence of the waves, you know, this is what we've seen around the world with economics. You know, economics has so many factors and they have their own uh, wavelengths and sometimes there is a, a resonance effect and uh, all of the adverse effects kind of coincide in a certain period of time. So, uh, this, is, this has been, therefore, a year when people have been rather more worried than they would normally be. But I continue to be an optimist in terms of looking at uh, where we are headed. Uh, I think this time around, both the government and the industry are much clearer about what is expected. If those of you who might remember that when we had to go through the previous uh, emission regime change between BS3 and BS4, there was a lot of confusion, perhaps uh, deliberate and perhaps sometimes uh, uh, not reading the tea leaves very well, but there was a lack of clarity as to whether the date of uh, manufacture would apply for vehicles to be sold after the 1st of April or the date of sale. Uh, the some of the industry chose to take a rather liberal view and they were rather badly affected by the fact that the, when the government said no, it is the date of manufacture or the date of sale. This time around there's no lack of uh, ambiguity, I mean, there's no lack of clarity uh, and this has caused the entire industry and indeed the government and indeed even the oil companies to start to get ready uh, for this uh, transition. 
Um, as you've seen already now, many of the uh, automakers across the sectors have started to roll out their BS6 machines. And uh, in a way, you can imagine if you're if within the industry, this is a very difficult time. If you produce uh, enough vehicles that you think will meet demand, and you find that demand is not so uh, robust, you know, you've got a whole fleet of vehicles that are good for nothing. You've got to scrap them. Uh, on the other hand, you underproduce and you're losing market share. So, you, and, and this is, uh, uh, you know, there is a whipsaw effect between what uh, an OEM or a manufacturer does and what cascades down into the supply chain. So, a wrong call will have rather uh, serious consequences, not only to the manufacturer, but the entire supply chain. So this is a year when the industry has been called upon to be on its toes. And from whatever I can see, I think we are doing a better job this time. I think there are going to be fewer companies that are going to be surprised. There is a greater effort across the industry and the supply chain to kind of fine tune this approach to a critical threshold. So I, I think uh, we are uh, hopefully uh, not going to have such a major issue, although you know, the, you're always going to find some automakers who are less prepared and uh, there will be a consequence. Now, the usual, uh, you know, how do we get out of this? Um, there are, there is a clamor for a lot of short-term relief. Um, there is a wish that, you know, there is an adjustment in GST. In fact, Nir Nirmala Sitaraman probably gets a year full about this uh, every week now. Uh, I, I would actually echo uh, Mr. Suresh Krishna's uh, comment to Nirmala Sita Raman last week in Chennai where he basically said, you know what, you know, steady as she goes is probably the best course for the economy on a whole. There will be short term pressures, but what the country gains by stable policies over a longer period of time will probably serve it good stead and, and I tend to agree with that uh, point of view. The other quick fix is, of course, the uh, plea to allow or require scrapping of old vehicles. Actually, I view that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that appeal uh, with mixed emotions. You know, I think on the one hand, uh, in a country like ours, with um, a rather uh, constrained affordability. It's not fair to tell somebody who's bought a car, you know, it's 10 years old now, you've got to scrap it, or 15 years old now, you've got to scrap it. Uh, there, is a, there is some sort of a moral, uh, social uh, dimension to that uh, rule. But on the other hand, if there is a sensible approach of incentivizing retirement of older vehicles, maybe passing them on to second-hand markets that are further away from the metro cities where the bulk of the air quality issues are, Maybe it is a sensible approach to try to, to stimulate demand, although overall on that particular issue, I'm always um, uh, ambivalent. <laughs> but looking ahead, uh, beyond where we are with the BS6 transition, um, what's the industry going to look like? Uh, the first thing we will have to accept is uh, prices will go up. Um, Whatever automotive product, whether it's a scooter, motorcycle, car, uh, commercial vehicle, uh, I think the expectation is that prices will go up anywhere between 5 and 15 percent. And that range exists because of A, uh, there are different classes of vehicles that require different degrees of change going from where we are to where we have to be. And so these changes can be different and therefore reflect in a different cost change. But very importantly, it also will depend upon the degree to which manufacturers uh, and indeed the entire supply chain uh, suck it in and reduce their margins. Um, every emission change over the last 30 years has seen oh. margins compress uh, because uh, emission improvements are not something consumers are stepping up to saying, I'm going to pay for it. And this is true whether you're in, you know, environmentally conscious countries like Germany and Sweden or whether you're in the US or India. Uh, that message has not yet gone to the point where consumers say, I'm willing to pay more money to get a more emission friendly car. So, uh, but 
uh, governments, societies are obliged to bring in these rules because there are the obligations of cleaner air, better emission standards and so on. So in a sense, what has happened in the, in the history, uh, at least over the last 30 years, has been uh, operating margin and uh, margin compression each time we've gone through any of these changes. So this is something that we have to, uh, we'll have to get, it, get adjusted to. I think we're going to also see, um, particularly in the smaller segments, you're going to see lesser diesel offerings. Now, there are many who say, you know, diesel and petrol have reached parity at the pump. Costs are about the same. Well, but the reality is uh, fuel economy is different, you know, um, and no matter what you say, Sharad Vijayaraghavan always tells me, even the guy who comes in and buys an S-Class Mercedes, the second question he says is, what's the mileage? Uh, so mileage uh, and the expenditure out of pocket every time you fill up a tank of uh, diesel or petrol is an issue. And no matter what you do, you will see city fuel economy for diesels to be significantly better. And so there will be, again, uh, a bit of an increase in cost of operation of vehicles. Uh, the Alongside, we, while we have a lot of focus on the emission standards, one must also recognize that there has been a parallel evolution and improvement in standards related to other systems, uh, such as safety. And these continue to also advance, and these are also having the effect of um, increasing the price of vehicles. Uh, in, in, in the past, uh, I remember Indian, the Indian industry particularly would be very apprehensive about many of the newer safety regulations because in the early years every new safety technology ultimately meant only one thing that you had to spend more money with the foreign supplier most of the technologies whether it was anti-lock braking systems whether it was electronic stability control systems they were all uh, essentially leading to a greater quantum of purchases from global tier one suppliers and uh, this meant, A, the, the manufacturers had to shell out more money, and it was typically an expensive addition. Fortunately now, I'm, I'm very happy to see many of the Indian, Indian industry, uh, Indian automakers, have really uh, decided to take a different uh, road. Uh, particularly Tata and then Mahindra are now providing some of the safest cars on our roads today. Uh, the Tata Altros, the Tata Nexon, the Mahindra Marazzo, these are all products now that meet the highest safety standards. They're all rated five star of the global end cap test. And for a, for a change, now we're seeing the Indian manufacturer is saying, we're going to take the high road. I'm going to put in the right kind of technology. I'm hoping that this will serve as a marketing platform for my products in the country. Um, what this is also doing is, as we have upgraded emission standards and as we've upgraded our safety standards, all of a sudden we find that our products are now better suited to a larger range of export markets. I remember uh, when I was at Tata Motors, uh, when we were you know, on this growth phase with the Tata Indica and the Indigo and Marina and so on, uh, Initially, we had very few export options. Uh, we'd export cars to Bangladesh, we'd export cars to Sri Lanka, maybe a couple of other places in Africa, but frankly, we had very few places we could send our cars. But as we started to get through the BS2 to the BS3 evolution, all of a sudden we found that we could supply Tata Indicas to countries like South Africa, to Turkey, and even the European Union. We were selling cars from India to the UK uh, to be badged as UK products. So. This migration to BS6 and the adoption of many of the newer standards should place our industry in a much better position uh, to be able to compete in several overseas markets. Uh, of course, the sad uh, the, the downside to this is everywhere we go, we're finding extremely aggressive Chinese competition, extremely aggressive and subsidized Chinese competition. So we have to, you know, battle that as we force our way into becoming a better export player in many of these markets. The, the subsequent wave, as I said, these, these sequence of waves, the third wave that I see is this whole evolution of 
uh, thinking, uh, which is evolving from uh, not just a focus on cars and, and uh, the vehicles, but as Anuragun mentioned, uh, uh, we're starting to think about mobility. Um, before I decide to come here this uh, today, I have to decide the previous day as to whether I have to get my driver in, whether there is parking, where and how I will be able to. Uh, and this this is becoming a, a critical issue. Last week we had a, an event at the Bharati of Vidya Bhavan in uh, uh, East Maharashtra, and I I was a, I was no stranger to East Maharashtra when I was growing up. But you go down there today, and there's hardly place to walk, let alone drive your car. And even in the two minutes, my driver was looking for parking. The police guy put his hand through the window and gave him a ticket. So, uh, we are beginning to find uh, issues related to how will we deal with this uh, transition to mobility. Uh, let, me, let, me pick all, let me address the two main topics therefore, electrification and mobility. I think the uh, policy that the government has uh, put in place was initially a little confusing because there was this uh, so-called mandate to say, particularly two-wheelers, we will have a complete trans transition to electric vehicles by 2025. Since then, it has kind of been uh, scaled back, but there have been multiple views. But by and large, the government continues to believe that we will see an acceleration in electrification and mobility. And uh, I believe the government uh, rightly feels that as we uh, strive to address the terrible conditions of air quality in so many cities and as we strive to address this uh, huge uh, overhang of expense related to oil imports, we have to find a different course. So electrification seems to be uh, a given objective and the way it's, it's playing out, it seems to happen at the two ends. It's happening at the very light end with the two-wheelers and the so-called scooters and motorcycles and with buses. To me, it's a very logical approach. Um, at the two-wheeler end, the infrastructure needed to promote migration to electrification is rather easy. And at the heavy end, the infrastructure is going to be concentrated. Uh, it's going to be defined infrastructure you need for charging. and if there is any subsidy, and we all know that in its in initial years, electrification will require some form of subsidy from the government, it is easier to justify a subsidy to a bus system operating in a city than to avoid uh, uh, to justify a subsidy for a few people to be able to go out and buy a Tesla. So I think the approach of saying let's encourage electrification at the light vehicle end and let's el encourage electrification in urban mobility is perhaps the right uh, set of priorities. Uh, the car segment to me will take longer um, for the simple reason that the charging infrastructure required to support cars is a lot more complicated. First of all, the standards are very different. You have you know, AC charging and you have DC charging and you have DC uh, low power charging and you have DC high power charging. So very often today, when you look at the charging systems in place in Europe, in Europe, in European cities, it's very similar to going up to a petrol pump and saying, you know, do I want uh, 87 octane? Do I want 93 octane? You've got paddles for all of these different configurations. And the average charger is sized for anywhere between 250 to 500 kilowatts. And you put five of those and you're already talking about megawatts of power uh, in a particular concentrated location and it has huge implications on the grid. So I think the migration that India will make for electrification of cars uh, is going to take a little longer and maybe it will be uh, a somewhat staggered approach. There will be a few charge points and there will perhaps be an encouragement for you to set up charging stations either at your place of work or at your residence. Uh, and it may not be the universal availability of charging that is necessary to sustain uh, cars being bought by consumers who just say, I want to get in today and I want to drive to Bangalore for a, for a visit. The other uh, challenge that we have to, uh, that we will face with this electrification is uh, twofold. Uh, one is 
we've already seen the auto industry, uh, the core automakers have been slowly pushing more and more value addition to their supply chain. You know, even a company like BMW or Mercedes, you know, 20 years ago, BMW or Mercedes would make their own transmission. Today, they say, you know, let's buy it from ZF, let's buy it from Getra. As we now go into electrification, we're seeing an even greater fraction of critical systems be outsourced to the supply chain. Most of the companies will no longer make their own motors. They will no longer make their own battery packs. They may make their motor controllers in the battery controller, but that's a small piece of electronics compared to a lot of value that goes on. So pretty soon, automakers may make the shell of the vehicle, they will manage the interiors, they will manage the brand, they will manage the user experience, but there will be a greater and greater degree of uh, offloading to a supply chain to be able to do this. Uh, fear is that when this happens, uh, the hope is that the Indian supply chain will continue to retain a good share of this value and we don't, we, we won't see a situation where as we have seen with other critical technologies like safety and emissions, that more of this value goes away to multinational global supply chain um, and, and therefore we're essentially, you know, holding less in the country. Uh, as part of technology and economic value. This concern is amplified uh, in the case of electrification because of this enormous threat of what the Chinese industry can do. We're already seeing uh, in the last three to four years an acceleration in the pace with which the Chinese manufacturers are targeting India. Uh, MG is a British brand, but for all practical purposes, it's uh, Shanghai Automotive Corporation from China. Uh, the other plant from General Motors is now acquired by Great Wall. Uh, PYD is anxious to make a bigger push into India. And as China finds that its own domestic market is beginning to flatten, one can bet, as they've, as they've done with steel, uh, one can bet that they will be making a very aggressive push into markets outside of China and uh, India is a very, very attractive target for companies like this. And, and while we have within the government uh, some elements of a make in India policy, uh, I think we need a much more cohesive combination of investments, policies and uh, uh, trade pacts to make sure that we retain enough of the value in, in India.